You are now listening to Bigfoot and Beyond, featuring the OG bad boys of Bigfoot, the Dr. Heckle and Mr. Jive of Squatchology, the Chip and Dale of Bigfoot, and I'm not talking about the cartoon. Please welcome your hosts, the Bigfoot celebrity couple, Biff Clobo, better known as Cliff Berrickman and James Bobo Fay. Bobo, I understand you have a fantastic guest lined up for us today. I do, and I learned about him from you, actually. And I haven't read his book, but I've, it's on my top of my list. We got Gareth Patterson from South Africa. Gareth, welcome to Bigfoot and Beyond, and thank you very much for your patience uh, with us and technology and speaking to us all the way from South Africa. Oh, it's a pleasure. I just hope the call stays, and uh, yeah, great to speak to you guys. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. And, you know, uh, thanks for writing your book, by the way, as well. Um, my good friend Matt Pruitt recommended the book tour to me. Um, I started reading it and I went, oh, my gosh, this is going to be one of the most important books on uh, uh, on relic hominoids written at this time period. Um, I, I immediately texted Dr. Jeff Meldrum and he says, oh, yeah, I already know about it. I'm reading it right now. So you've already been making waves in the Bigfoot community um, and we really need to talk to you about what you've learned about these things so far and a little bit about the background of what you knew beforehand. So let's start there. Um, for people who don't know who you are, can you give us a brief rundown of your qualifications, your um, professional background and that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, I come from a background of lion research and, and really fighting for the greater protection of the African lion as well as the African elephant. I started very young. I started at the age of about 17 as an apprentice uh, game ranger, trainee game ranger in, in South Africa and then moved to Botswana. Um, so that was about 1983. And then I studied the population of lions in in Botswana, uh, which really opened my eyes up to, I know it's off the, the Bigfoot, uh, Bigfoot subject, but I just want to add this, um, to the actual plight of the lion, I started studying this population and um, it really opened my eyes to what's happening to the lion throughout Africa. Um, in my working life of about 30 something years, uh, the lion population, when I first started studying lions, was about quarter of a million lions, and today it's about uh, fifteen to 20,000, uh -huh. and a lot of people don't know that. Um, but I went on from there to, to, to work with, the, with the, um, the Lion Man of Africa, uh, the grand old Lion Man of Africa, George Adamson, of Born Free fame. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he he was murdered by um, by by poachers by ivory poachers when he was uh, rehabilitating the last of the born free lions. And after his murder, I rescued his um, his last three lions and moved them from Kenya uh, to Botswana, where I'd studied lions and I living as a human member of a of a lion's pride I rehabilitated them back into the wild uh, which was successful the females had cubs and I'd like to think the bloodline of those famous lions are still is still going today and in that in that period I've written 12 books the majority I think 12 books the majority of them have been about uh, lions and the last two the last to, well, I've written two about elephants, uh, The Secret Elephants in 2009, and then this new one, Beyond the Secret Elephants, uh, which came out in January this year. And during that time, um, like I, you must have just been astounded to stumble across a Sasquatch-like creature out in the woods. Were you even aware that these things may have been in, in Africa anywhere, let alone South Africa, before you stumbled upon one? That's a really great question. Um, I've never thought about it that way. Um, we, 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 we've known of creatures such as what they called historically in East Africa, the Agogwi. Um, reports are very scant in, in Southern Africa. But basically what happened was that I came down to Nisna, where I'm speaking to you now, on the edge of the Nisna Forest, which is an Afro-Montane forest system of about 600 square kilometers, surrounded by a massive wilderness area of what we call famebos vegetation. I came down here in 99 by default more than anything else. I was setting up a 
natural habitat sanctuary for three lions that I'd saved from the notorious, infamous um, canned lion industry in South Africa, where lions have been bred to, to be shot by hunters. We rescued these lions, and I was basically setting up this sanctuary not far away from Neisner, and I decided to visit the area with my girlfriend at the time. And while, while staying in a hotel, a hotel manager told us a very strange story as we were about to venture into the forest for the first time. In short, he was telling, that, telling me that um, some German guests of his had, um, had gone into the forest, asked him for directions into the forest, as we had asked him. And, um, and uh, they, they, he, he next saw them in the afternoon in the bar of the hotel, and they're looking very shocked. He asked them what was wrong, <clears throat> what was wrong, and um, and he's and and they said no, things are not all right. Uh, we went into the forest and we saw these three human-like figures running across the road in front of us. Uh, the hotel manager immediately said, "No, what you saw was baboons." And at that stage, they got quite angry with him. They said, "Look, we're well-traveled, well-educated people. We certainly know what baboons are." And uh, these were not baboons. And he, uh, the hotel manager, recounted this story to me as I was about to go into the forest. And at that stage, as I went into the forest, my mind was still, yes, perhaps what they had seen was baboons, because we know that baboons will stand upright for a short period of time to look further away or whatever. Um, but I never imagined what would come after that. You know, uh, two years later, when I first came down to to research into the most southerly elephants in the world that live here, the, 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 the amazing Neisner elephants. And so you were out actually doing elephant research, and then you event your first encounter actually was a sighting. Is that correct, if I remember correctly from the book? Yeah, what happened was that stories, as I started to research into the elephant stories by default, started drifting towards me. Um, a forestry botanist, asked me one day that, you know, during your research, Gareth, have you ever come across an upright hominoid um, being in the forest? And I, I said to him, no. I said, why do you ask? And he says, no, because on two separate occasions, our forestry workers have reported seeing such a being. And other stories drifted in. And it was, yes, it was about a year later after I'd been here. It was in uh, 2002. With the last thing on my mind, you know, an upright relic hominoid being around, I was I was in a remote area. It was a clear day, a Sunday. I'd done my research. I was heading back to my vehicle, and I had a feeling um, that I was being watched. That feeling that you get. And I turned to my left, and I saw this figure of about five foot three, just peeping curiously behind a, a pine tree. And um, my my bush training instinct, whatever, just told me keep keep the being in sight as long as you can. Just keep on walking. Uh, don't stop because that can be seen as a threat. And I kept on walking um, for about I don't know maybe about a kilometer. And then I, then after that, to be absolutely honest, I just slumped to the ground in total shock with what I'd seen. Can you describe? Uh, um any details about what what you could observe from the distance that you that you saw this thing from? It was to my left, and um, distance I would say about fifty to seventy five meters or so, approximately, if I remember correctly. Um, about five foot three. Um, certainly, an aura, an air of curiosity, um, <laughs> and it was just peeking with its head and part of a shoulder. Um, from the from the left hand side of the of the, of the tree, and for some strange feeling in sort of quick hindsight at the time at the day, I sensed I sensed it it was female for some reason. Okay, what color was it? Like a brown or a black or a red or what, how would you describe the color? I would describe it as as um, russet color, not. Not unlike, I mean, it was actually, ironically, it was in Californian pines. I mean, it was a, a strand of pines. Um, and it was very much the color of, you know how the pine needles, when they fall to the ground, that russet color. That was basically a little bit darker than, than the needles, yeah. Ah, huh, okay. 
uh, that was your first sighting, but to date, how many sightings have you had of these things? Okay, in the, I mean, this has been, this has been, I mean, the, the Elephant Project and all the other work I've been doing down here has been a long, long period of time. So it's coming up close to 20 years now. And in that time, I've had four clear sightings and two um, very brief sightings. Um, the, 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 the most astonishing sighting was actually the fourth sighting because um, when, when my book, The Secret Elephants, came out, a lot of people contacted me wanting to go into the forest with me. And I started this little mini expedition thing called The Secret Elephants Forest Experience. And I take groups of, small groups of people into the forest and to the wilderness areas. And, and finishing off one of those trips with a group, quite a large group for me, because I normally only take about two or three people, um, I was with about six people and they had all read The Secret Elephants and we were looking down this steep gorge at a, at a beautiful pool of water, you know, quite a few hundred feet below us. And uh, the one woman was looking with binoculars and then suddenly she said to us all, well, she said to me, she said, what is that, Gareth? What is that? This was 2017. And I looked down, and um, not 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 in the shock of the first sight. I looked down, and I saw what looked like approximately, I'd say, six and a half, seven foot, Otung walking three quarters of the way, three quarters body uh, body um, angle away from us. Um, and and um, and I replied to them. I said to them, you know, I said to the people, you've read The Secret Elephants. Do you remember? Because I mentioned very briefly in that book about the Otung, not much about the Otung in that earlier book. And they nodded. And I said, well, I, that's got to be what it is. And then it was quite interesting for me because I then saw the shock that they experience which mirrored my experience all those years ago in 2002 and we drove for half an hour back to our destination and in, in that period no one spoke they were totally silenced by shock of what they had seen <laughs> that's that's just so fascinating the um the, the the parallels between what you're describing not only in the uh um in what they look like, but also in the the observer's behavior with what we have here in North America. Because yeah. a lot of people, when they see a Sasquatch, their mind is blown um, and they don't have words. And they're, they have to like grapple with almost PTSD to try to understand what they're yeah. doing. You know? So it's very interesting. It's as far as their behaviors go, I'm so interested um, in, in this because um, one of the one of the questions that nags me is how many species of relic hominoids are there in the world? Um, people ask me often if the Yeti is the same thing as the Sasquatch, uh, and of course the answer mm. is we don't we don't know. But um, in in South Africa, this is the best information that's come out. Really, there's very little out of Africa in general, um, and only, I think, a few articles out of South Africa about possible, you know, relic hominoids like this. So, mm. in, in your work, have you noticed any of the uh, behaviors that seem to be reported here in North America? And what I'm, and examples would be rock throwing, um, long moaning howls or knocking on trees or sounds that seem to be knocking on trees or anything like that. Have you noticed any of those behaviors or others that maybe I'm not aware of? The, the parallels are, are really fascinating. Um, first of all, um, just like with the Neisner elephants, um, these beings, to to my knowledge, what I can see, they're, they're not actually in, inhabiting so much the dense Afro-Montane forest. They're really on the forest edge and in what we call Feinbos, um vegetation. Uh, it's a bit of a misnomer with the nice elephants. They equate them to living purely in the forest, but they don't. Um, it's a very dark, dank um, place, particularly in winter. No one really would want to be in there. But so it seems the Otung, like the elephants, are living on the majority of the time in the periphery. It's a massive wilderness area 
well over a thousand square kilometers. I mean, there's so much space here. And we have experience. I experience in November um, and December, I experience um, a stone throwing, uh, small stones being thrown near to, on one occasion, me and two German guests who, are, who I was taking out on a forest experience. And then with my girlfriend, Kirsten, we experienced the same thing. Um, in terms of vocalizations, um, what I can only really attribute to Otung here was on one particular occasion. I was in an area um, far into this Garden Root National Park. Uh, there's an area of private land where there's plantations and there's only one road in and one road out. And I was in there. On, on a Sunday morning, and I was actually beginning to head back quite a few kilometers to my vehicle when suddenly to my left-hand side, I heard a low mumbling vo vocalization. I'll, I'll try and mimic it. It was sort of... I know that sounds ridiculous, but that's what it sounded like. And then that got me wondering, and within a few seconds, a little bit further to the, to the left... It was a higher vocalization, and it sounded like a reply. And then it was to and fro between the two. And that was really shocking because I knew that there was no one out there. There was no tracks of people. There was no tracks of vehicles. It was very early on a Sunday morning. No one was working out there. So I can only really attribute that to the Otung. And the, and the third thing, um, what we're noticing more and more um, is coming across very, very interesting tree structures. Um, I'm talking about um, arches, but I mean, I'm about six foot, six foot one, and at least two and a half times my height, a, you know, trees being bent over with the tip of the tree being pushed into the ground. So the head of the, I mean, it's like an ostrich bearing its head in the sand. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but you've got this this very fine tree, um, probably about 25, 30 years old, and it's it's somehow it's it, the tip of the tree is being um, into the ground, and it's very it's it's held very firmly there somehow somehow it's anchored. We found the first one in November last year. Um, and then in December, in the same vicinity, after looking in the in the close vicinity of there, we came across another four, I think it was. And since then, we have found um, even more as well. The footprints I've 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 managed to uh, cast the one very very early days, um, long long time ago. Um, and otherwise, what I've done is I've photographed. Uh, there's actually a photograph in my book, um, Beyond the Secret Elephants, of, again, a very strange situation whereupon we came across the very small footprint of, I'd say, about 15 centimeters or less um, of a human-like footprint, and the footprint led on. And if you do that calculation, that 6.67 mean data calculation of, of people's foot foot size to, to height and age. If it was a person, it would mean that it would be a child of about three to four years old. And there's certainly no child of three to four years old walking around here in the mid barefoot in the middle of nowhere. Um, so that really was a, a, a surprise as well in terms of footprints. So footprints, yes, we do. But the substrate, I must admit, the substrate here is, 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 is not great for footprints. Uh, because in the forest itself or forest edge, you've got the leaf litter and outside in the famboss, it's quite stony. Even finding the clear footprints of the elephants, believe it or not, is very, very difficult here. Stay tuned for more Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We'll be right back after these messages. Yeah, I mean, Cliff, you had a look at that footprint, and you thought it looked it looked quite interesting. I'm, I'm looking at the footprint right now. Um, I, of course, your book isn't available in the United States right. in a hard copy, so it's a Kindle version that I'm looking at. And I'm looking at the photograph of the footprint right now, and it isn't very large, I'm assuming, because that's a lighter next to it. And you said it was very pretty small. Um, 
what I find interesting about it is are, is the toe configuration because it's not very detailed, it's not very deep, but the toe configuration doesn't suggest human because of the uh, the splay of the toes. They seem just a little bit too far apart as opposed to being compacted all together. Um, but at this point, I mean, with such a small data set of, you know, a handful yeah. of footprint, it's hard to say much about it. It would be nice to get like a nice 14-inch footprint or something like that to compare what an adult Otung would be compared to a Sasquatch to see if they're the same things or closely related or God knows what. That's what I'm going to be doing. I've taken I've taken some more photographs over the over the years, and um, um, you know perhaps at, you know perhaps at some time I can actually send them over to you, Cliff, because I mean that's your that's your skill side rather than mine. I'd I'd like to send them over to you to uh, for you to actually have a look to see what you think. Oh, I would love it. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm just one person and science is about, you know, uh, sharing data and seeing what other people think. Um, I strongly recommend either you send it to Dr. Jeff Meldrum or um, I can talk to Jeff about it as well. So keep that in mind as well. Just share it widely and see what people see in it. So have you had any primatologists contact you about your OTANG sightings? I was in contact. I was in contact um, when I was writing the Secret Elephants. I was in contact with a very world-renowned paleontologist, South African, Zimbabwean paleontologist um, called Doctor Doctor Bob Rain of um, of in 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 Johannesburg, who Stoke Fontaine Caves and the Cradle of Mankind. Um, I had contacted him because a a skull of a primate had been found. And we couldn't work out what this primate was, and I got in contact with the um, with Professor uh, Brain, and it was only during our conversations that he started telling me that uh, for years he he himself had been investigating into um, potential sightings of what we know of down here as the Otung. So he had a professional interest in in that, and I always remember his. Him saying to me, um, you know, he's a very highly esteemed paleontologist, and he said to me one day, Gareth, nothing can be discounted, and and that meant a lot to me hearing it from such a you know such a figure as himself. Apart from um, Dr. Uh, years ago, I was in contact with um, I believe um, colleagues of of you and Bobo actually, um, Jeremy Holden and and Debbie Mart- Martia. Uh, in Sumatra with the Otung, we were we were communicating back in all oh, about fifteen years ago. But in recent times, um, my colleague Ian Redmond and 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 then Professor Meldrum. Well, all of the above are fantastic. I'm glad that you're not working in isolation. It just blows my mind that here you are, a respected naturalist. I'm just really shocked that you're not getting. A bunch of anthropologists and primatologists contacting me about this. Yeah, I haven't heard. I haven't heard from anyone that I didn't know. I, I must admit. Um, but what has been very intriguing is since the book has come out, um, a number of people have come forward and contacted me with their own local sightings in this area. Um, I mean, sightings that I, I had one lady, for example, from Cape Town, which is about six hours away from here. She's win- well into her 80s today, and she contacted me after reading the book, and she recounted a, a sighting she had with her parents about 65 years ago, and she had kept quiet about this sighting. For, for you know, for over sixty something years, um, I, and so people are, are are contacting me because I think they can see through the book that they can get some kind of validation, um, and you know they know they're not going crazy, and uh, you know the bulk of the the the, the sightings that I recount in the book. Um, they're all sorts of people. They're local people. They're indigenous people. One thing I must add is that uh, the, the 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 forest people. There's a small population of indigenous people here who have lived for decades in the in the forest, and to them, um, like this 
a friend of mine, Mrs. Jordan, who was probably the last of her ger- generation of the very, of what you could call the First Nation people of Southern Africa, the San or the Bushmen. Um, to her um, and her family, the Otang was 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 interesting, but no more really interesting than than the elusive elephants or the bushbucks or or the bush pig or whatever. That they're just another form of life that live in the vicinity of the forest and outside the forest. Um, and you know, it's you know certainly nothing in 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 the way of myths and legends. I mean, they would describe it as very much a flesh and blood. Uh, animal in, and they describe it in a very matter of fact way. So they don't they don't give it any kind of like humanistic qualities, like how Native American tribes look at Bigfoot as another tribe of human, just wild human beings. They see it as an animal. No, they they see it as they you know from the people that I speak to here, they see it as something that is very much human like. It's it's an it's a human like. When I say they don't see it any different to the other animals, I mean, it's everything in the same category in terms of um, inhabiting the forest and everything, and that they see them as a, as a human, human-like human being. Let's put it that way. Here with like Bigfoot researchers, we've learned, like, you look back at what the natives have always said, they, they know what they're eating already. Like, they already know their, like, family lifestyle kind of groupings. Do you, have you researched enough to find out, like, what they're, it is what their family like social structure is and that sort of thing absolutely that's that's a that's a great question because that's basically where i'm at at the moment i mean the book was really um to let people know that these beings um they do exist here and the next stage of the research is to look into their ecology to look into um aspects of behavior very much as I studied these elusive elephants, I'm going about it the same way um, by trying to find out, you know, what is their diet? What is their range? You know, what is the groupings? That sort of stuff. Obviously, a hell of a lot of work to be done. But, I, you know, I, 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 I figured that, you know, what could be a bit of a giveaway in terms of a pointer of, of their movements and all the rest of it is um, we have... Another um, primate onivore here, fairly large one, which is the Chakma baboon, which is an onivore living within the range of the Otung. And both being um, onivores and the diet of these baboons being fairly well known, I think I will get pointers in terms of what the Otung must be eating. And I find that fascinating because you've got troops of about 45 um, 40 to 45 baboons here. Their ranges in this part of South Africa is fairly small, only about 10 square kilometers. Research has shown that these troops uh, probably only move about four to five kilometers a day, and that is sustaining them. So that really raises a lot of questions, interesting questions about the range size and the diet of the Otung here. Well, yeah, there seems a, a, wow. a troop of 40 baboons. That must take a lot of calories to keep moving. And then when I think of, you know, the elephants that live in the area, this must be just an astonishingly rich area for food resources. Uh, so to those ends, have you come to any early conclusions or at least hypotheses about what the Otungs are eating? No, it's it's really, really early days. I mean, I'm, I'm getting sort of indications that they are pulling off bark and they might be going for the larvae of beetles. Um, but it's very, very difficult. Like I say, it's very, very early stage. Looking into the diet is really just what we're starting with now. But you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I remember on one occasion when I was doing the DNA research with the elephants, in one morning alone, I came across four separate troops of baboons in four separate areas um, in, the, in the same general locality, but over, over a big area, four different troops, roughly about 40 baboons in each troop. Um, so close on, you know, coming up to, you know, 200 individuals in one locality, big locality, but, but still it, it, it illustrates what you've just said, um, that there is obviously the, the nutritional foods there to sustain a lot of beings out there. 
Absolutely. Stay tuned for more Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We'll be right back after these messages. When you were describing the habitat earlier, it, it, it sounded like a fairly smallish area, but I realize you're describing one particular spot surrounded by wilderness. Um, how big is this wilderness area? Um, do you have any uh, numbers on that? Um, approximately, what I what I discovered with the elephants over the years, every year it seemed as if they're recolonizing more and more of their historical range. I mean, once upon a time, elephants existed right from, um, like from Cape Town, six hours away, all the way along the eastern side, eastern coast of South Africa, up into Mozambique. It was one continuous population. And it seems the elephants are, 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 are in, in this particular area, their range was increasing on a yearly basis because there's so much space in terms of mountains and and real wilderness areas. Um, you know, you, the elephants could carry on here for forever. I mean, it's such a tiny, tiny population. No one, no one really knows how how many or how few the elephants are, but it's a tiny little population. But but in terms of um, you know the the the, the, the wilderness areas, it's. It, it's it's quite an amazing area because the human population is all gravitated and built up along the coast. Uh, the nearest town to me, Neisner, is a little tourist holiday maker town, very beautiful place. But everyone is is you know congregated on the coast there with their holiday homes and hotels and all the rest of it. While you go seven kilometers inland to where I'm speaking to you now, if I walk out of my cabin up a road to the gate and I look north, I cannot, looking north into the wilderness area at night, I cannot see a single light. It's just darkness out there. It's, it's fantastic that such a large wilderness area still exists. So they have more than enough to, room to wander around in, it sounds like to me. Uh, now, over the last uh, X number of years, um, and with the footprints that you have found, do you think you have found the footprints of the same individual Otung, or do you think you found different footprints? I think I've found, I think I've certainly found footprints of different, of different Otungs. Uh, different size um, O-tongues, you know, going from the very smallest I told you about and medium medium size to larger sizes. Um, but, you know, it's something that's a little bit frustrating. Like I said, you know, the substrate is so difficult to work with, but it, it's just going to get, get time. But certainly, yes, of more, certainly of more than of, of one individual and in, and, and in quite diverse areas as well i mean like the one of the of the little one is is less than two kilometers from my house whereupon another one of quite a large otang is way up in the mountains for for example years ago and it was a good sized footprint again not walking on the road but emerging from from the vegetation up a mountain a small mountain and and crossing the gravel road from left to right and disappearing off into the vegetation again, not walking along the road. So in the middle of nowhere, these, these large footprints, barefoot, not a person crossing a road in the middle of nowhere. It's quite extraordinary. And how large was it? I would the say it was approximately, um, a, I would say approximately about, uh, about 28, 20, about my, about my foot size. I'd say about, yeah, about 29 centimeters, somewhere around there. That's what, about 12 inches, I think, for our American listeners? Yes, about that size. Now, at that size, for a Sasquatch, um, there would be, uh, the foot would be much wider than in a human. It would be at least as wide as a man's boot of the same size. Was that the case with the Otung as well? What I'm finding is an, an indication of um, whether it's male or female, looking at particularly that one in the book and looking at um, other ones, I find that that one in the book, for example, I get an indication by the slenderness of it. Um, 
and the shape of it, like in comparison with a with a woman's foot compared to a male's foot, a male's foot is much more blocky, if you know what I mean, much more of a square mm-hmm. sort of rectangle shape as opposed to a, a more more sort of delicate, if you want to call it that shape, of a female. So I mean that is early indications perhaps of of male and and female with uh, with the tracks. But I've got I've got tremendous amount of work to do, you know. Um, on this, it's very early, early days with this. Very exert, a, exciting early days, but early days. That's something that uh, Dr. Meldrum mentioned to me last year. Is that he thinks that it might be a sexually dimorphic trait in Sasquatches, um, whereas the females have more slender feet. Uh, the Patterson Gimlin film creature, for example, has a little bit uh, more narrow feet in relation to its length than some of the larger ones that we think are attributed to males. So it's interesting that you came across that so early on in your own study. So congratulations there. But we don't know that, of course, but that's an interesting um, hypothesis to kind of follow and see if the, that bears that's fruit. Right. Yeah. It's so close to the coast. Um, and Sasquatches in the coast regions here are known to exploit the shoreline for food have you heard any of the natives or, or any reports of them coming from the ocean or then going down there picking up stuff on the beaches and rocks it's very interesting because um some fantastic archaeological work has, has been taken um ta- uh, taken place along this coastline for the last uh, couple of years last few years and actually inference of what was presumed to be Homo sapien date, dating back about two hundred thousand years. Um, were found these these imprints um, on fossilized um, dune dunes here, and it raised an interesting question because, as we know, uh, with the relative recent discovery of Homo naledi here in in cradle of mankind, was also coexisting coexisting with Homo sapiens in this part of the world around about that same time frame, um, and that their feet, um, now ladies' feet, were very, very similar to humans. Um, it's questionable whether it's Homo sapiens imprints we've got on the shoreline here, or perhaps Otung, or, or Homo naledi, or if, you know, maybe Otung is Homo naledi, I don't know. You know, yeah, that brings such a uh, such a fascinating question up. It's like what these things could be, uh, and which, of course, yeah. can be, that question can be applied to any of the relic hominoids throughout the world. Um, but uh, you know, just as recently as thirty years ago. Um, these things could not exist because of that idea of the one species hypothesis. But now we know that human evolution isn't like that. There's all sorts of branches and whatever else. And we know that Homo uh, naledi, which was, was, of course, discovered in South Africa, existed like, what, 100,000 years ago. That's that's practically yesterday, geologically. Um, to think that these things were running around with Homo sapiens in the same landscape is just fascinating. Yes, exactly. And it's still going on after all this time. Now, I, I didn't. I didn't know about Homo naledi's feet being similar in some ways to uh, humans. Um, and when I look at the Otang footprint in your book, there are some human-like elements to it. Um, it, it the narrowness, for example. So that brings up a fascinating question. Like, I, I wonder if there'd be any other um, identifying characteristics about Homo naledi that we could connect to the Otong if, in some way. Maybe the hand structure or something like that. I just, I just remember a quote by Professor Lee Berger or it might have been Professor John Hawkes, um, that with the discovery of uh, Naledi, they got a um, specialist in, in feet to look at the, the feet bones, the bones of the feet, and um, they were actually, they were really astounded. I mean, to, to quote either of them, I forget which one said this, but basically they said, looking at the feet of, of, of Homo naledi, the feet are Nike ready. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any indication that Otungs have a uh, an arch or are they more flat-footed 
from what you've observed in the woods? Because uh, the Sasquatches and many, in fact, most other hominins are flat footed with the flexibility about the mid part of the foot. Uh, there's there's indication that humans are kind of rare. Humans, Neanderthals, and to some degree uh, Heidelbergensis have an arch, uh, but the rest of them kind of don't. So it'd be interesting to see that. Or if you've uh, that is something that I'm really going to be looking into more and more. Um, like you said, I've, you know, I've become aware of this, you know, mid tarsal, and looking at it and some of the photos, you know, it does look like there is an arch there. Interesting. That would be that would be fascinating. What, one of the strange things um, that is sometimes reported here in the United States about with the Sasquatch are this there's this idea of eyes that generate light. And I'm not ready to believe it yet. Yeah. I don't think there's enough data. Have you had any strange reports about either eyes that seem to glow or at the bare minimum reflectivity in the Otong eyes? Again, that, that's such an interesting question because I've actually been in, the, in, a, in a vehicle on two occasions driving to, not me driving, but with other people driving a vehicle uh, to where I live at night. And um, the, the one occasion happened a number of years ago, probably about 15, oh, about 12 years ago. And um, an Otan did run in front of the vehicle. I was talking to a friend of my, mine sitting in the back seat. Uh, the person driving was a, was a friend of mine and was aware, um, who, who, had, who had spent time with me in the forest and was aware of Otan. And she swerved the vehicle to try and keep the lights on, on this fleeting figure. And um, since then, I've actually asked her, did you see any reflection of the eyes? And she said no. And the second occasion was in 2018. It was recently. I was coming back with a causa friend of mine, Tembella. He's, he's a young conservationist. He was driving me and my dog back from the vet, my, 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 my dog Tuli, my bush dog Tuli had just been diagnosed with, unfortunately, with tumors. We were driving back um, home at night and there was a, we were still on Tar Road and, and he slowed down for a speed bump and, um, and then drove on. And what he didn't tell me was that a very small Otung, probably he said 1.2 meters, ran across the road. Interestingly, he said nothing to me at the time. And a week later, I saw him and he said to me, these Otungas, are there small ones? And I said, yes, of course, there are. They're like people. I said, why? And he said, that night when we were driving Tuli back to your place, when we went over that speed bump, um, a small one ran in front of the car. And I said to him, well, you know, why? I, I had I had told him about Otung. He works in the he works as part of alien tree eradication here with the national parks, and um, so he knew about the existence of Otung. And and I said, why didn't you tell me then um, that you had this sighting? And he gave the typical eyewitness reply, um, which was. Um, I, I was worried that you wouldn't believe me. And I turned around to him and I said, well, of course I would believe you. I'm the person who introduced you to the fact that they <laughs> exist. And we had a chuckle about that. But recently I asked him, Bella, um, did you see any eye shine? Did you see any reflection? And just like with my other friend, they both actually say they didn't see any eye, eye shine, um, but the head of, of the being, of the Otung, was in the direction of, it, of, of where it was running, from right to left across the road. So it did not look into the headlights. So I can't say either way whether there is reflectivity with the eyes of the Otung yet. Gareth, we've come to the end of our time here. We need to get going. Um, but, you know, this has been such a fascinating conversation. We would we need to have you back. You are you basically got in on the ground floor, shall we say, of studying relic hominoids in South Africa. Um, not even you didn't even intend to do this, but whether you like it or not, you're there. Um, and I, I don't I can't imagine you not liking it. But this has been a fascinating conversation. We would love to have you back in a couple months. If you, if you know, just to check up on what you've been learning, with the sheer number of sightings that are going on, like to see four in twenty years, 
that may not seem like a lot to you, but I've been doing Bigfoot stuff for 25 years and I might've seen one Bigfoot. So you're doing right. great. Great. No, I'd love to be back on the show. That'd be fantastic. Thank you very much for the invitation. And for, for our listeners out there, you have to read Gareth's book. I cannot recommend his book strongly enough beyond the secret elephants this is going to be one of the landmark books in cryptozoology in general but especially the study of relic hominoids um in america as far as i'm aware it is not available in print you have to get the digital cop the digital version of it i bought mine through amazon on kindle and i don't get any money for this i'm not, i'm doing this because i think it's an important public service announcement to the bigfoot community you have to read his book. You will not be disappointed. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Bigfoot and Beyond. If you liked what you heard, please rate and review us on iTunes. Subscribe to Bigfoot and Beyond wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Bigfoot and Beyond Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Bigfoot and Beyond, that's an N in the middle, and tweet us your thoughts and questions with the hashtag Bigfoot and Beyond. 